set up. We'll get going. Yeah, Sheila, why don't you come to the opening, and then we'll do the three songs in a row. a moment, Lord, and just still our hearts, still our minds, and just stop. Yes. Stop everything and sit at your feet and think, think. of the beautiful, the beautiful reality that you are here. <laughs> us. You will never leave us or forsake us. You will never give us more than we can handle. And when we are carrying burdens that are too heavy for us to carry alone, you step in and you put your shoulder right under that burden and you carry it for us. And we just want to stop, stop and think of you to breathe in Thank your you. presence now, Thank O Lord, Jesus. because you are here. So, Lord, we worship you. Hallelujah. We worship you. Thank you, Lord. We are grateful. Oh, we are grateful what Thank you have done for us. The fact that you love us, the fact that you came and you died for us. Yeah, you came and you died you, for us. And you are our living, living, living Lord. And you said, I have come that you might have life and you might have it abundant and full and free and rich. So we thank you for that gift. 
In Jesus' name, amen. song turns on, uh, again, the page number is going to be page 14 for Blessed Assurance. There we go. Again. Maybe for you to learn this song. Come on. 
We'll sing it a little louder from our hearts. Declare the name of Jesus and the word of the Lord. Come on, let's sing. I can do all things. All things. I can do all things. All things. Through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. Whatever this life may be. Temporary pain Count it all joy, count it all joy 
Good morning. You may be seated. Give God the glory because God is good and all the time. Amen. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Amen. 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 Boy, it's sure nice to do those songs twice, isn't it? Yeah. That means that the Spirit is saying, honor me, worship me. Amen. It's not about time. It's about the Lord. And it's about his spirit. And I, my prayer is that the spirit of the Lord will touch whomever it needs to touch this morning in a powerful way. Amen. I pray that healing will go across our service. We ask that the healing will present itself to whomever that needs healing this morning. The scripture reading is going to be taken from Jeremiah 33 verses 14 to 17 in conjunction with the messages we've been given that the uh, Messiah will come and the Messiah will suffer and the Messiah will be resurrected and he sits at the right hand of God the Father. But Christ, the Messiah was uh, prophesied about over 2,000 years before Christ appeared. And so in Jeremiah, we're going to see that Jeremiah and the Israelites are being held captive in Babylon, but the Lord visited, God visits Jeremiah and gives Jeremiah a message. And this is part of the message that God gives Jeremiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called. The Lord, our righteous Savior. For this is what the Lord says, David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of Israel. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, we come before the throne of God right now and saying thank you. Thank you for your shed blood. Thank you for setting us free. We were captives to slavery, to the slavery of sin. And you shattered those shackles, dear Heavenly Father. And you gave us a new creation. And we are now one in Jesus Christ. And we are now back in fellowship with Almighty God. We thank you so very much. And we give you all glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We like to welcome all guests visitors that may be joining us today and it is our prayer that this will not be the last time that you would join us. We pray that you will come often and hear the word of God. We thank you for those that are viewing us via the internet and we like to say please join us as often as you can. We do have a beautiful website for those that are here today and want more of Hope Center of Christ and those that are viewing us on the internet that want more of Christ you can go to our, uh, our subscribe to at Hope Center of Christ YouTube 2019 and you will find more of our messages or some of our past messages that were given here at Hope Center of Christ. You can also go to our website, hopecenteroc.org for details of how to keep up with us, how to locate us if you should ever visit us here in the city of Orange. We also have details on how you may be able to read our uh, daily devotions that's there. They're provided by our dear Pastor Sheila and Pastor Katie. They've done a wonderful job on that website. Also, if you want to donate to Hope Center of Christ, we pray that you would hit that uh, donate button on our website and donate to us. We've, we feel that God has chosen us to be servants of what he gives us the way he blesses us and we have been good stewards with that and so if you want to donate even more than what you can do today please feel free to do so but don't feel any pressure at all God loves a cheerful giver 
single hearts for Christ. The single women's fellowship will be getting together this Saturday, the 25th, for brunch. It's going to be from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. You want more information? See our wonderful, wonderful hospitality person, Miss Susan Austin. She's not just hospitality. She runs the machine around here. Yesterday, we had an opportunity to serve chili to the Garden Grove seniors, and I think I had close to 12 volunteers because of Susan. And we served over 200 bowls of chili to some wonderful seniors that were looking for us. They were at anticipating our arrival because they just love fellowshipping with us and we fellowship with them. I'd like to thank all the volunteers that showed up. Holy Communion will be next week, 6-2. will be Holy Communion, so please come. And Oh, 6-2 isn't next week, is it? Well, see Susan for that mistake. No, she didn't make a mistake. I did. <laughs> but we will be celebrating our potluck on 6-2. That's in two weeks. The first Sunday of every month is when we fellowship. Don't start it. First, <laughs> the first Sunday is when we always fellowship at potluck. So please feel free to come. we like to thank all of our volunteers that participate to make sure that that potluck goes on uh, fabulously. Last week I made a mistake. I called Mike Lerman, Mike Struble, or Mike Lerman. Make sure that all of our videos are up on YouTube and on our website. And I like to acknowledge him and give him a round of applause. They tell me that Father's Day is going to be 616. So they have a special gift for fathers. I hope it's not soap on a rope. But... Uh, Millennials don't know about that soap on the rope or English lather, right? But we do, the old dogs, we know. So please, please come come on uh, Father's Day. Bring your fathers if your fathers are still with you. If not, bring someone else's father and allow him to celebrate the message on that day and, and to receive a free gift. Let us pray as we prepare our hearts to receive our tithes and offerings. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, it is with a cheerful heart that we bring our tithes and our offerings to your household, dear Heavenly Father. You have promised us, promised us in Malachi that if we would bring our fruits into your storehouse, then you will bless us abundantly, dear Heavenly Father. And also, dear Heavenly Father, in Genesis, Genesis 12, 3, you've said that, hey, if you will bless others, then we will receive a blessing from others, dear Heavenly Father. So it is with those promises that we stand on, knowing that what we give, dear Heavenly Father, that you will give back unto us. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that you're a wonderful God. You're worthy to be praised. We love you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. This song is just a consecration of your heart to the Lord, remembering the things he's asked us to do and being faithful to do it. And I know sometimes we're not thinking about the Lord in our day-to-day -day time, but we need to say, put the Lord first and make sure that we follow him with our whole heart. <clears throat>
if it looks like I'm moving slow and rickety, it's because I am. I hurt my back this week, but my voice still works. Wow, hasn't this been a great service? I just hope I don't mess it up. The title of today's message is Faith Lives Because He Lives. Why do you doubt? So today's message is about doubting Thomas. And the story is located at the end of John 20, verses 19 through 29. Don't look it up because I'm going to read it to you, okay? So just listen. That evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors in fear of the Jewish leaders when suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. After greeting them, he showed them his hands and side, and how wonderful was their joy when they saw the Lord. He spoke to them again and said, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and told them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you refuse to forgive them, they are unforgiven. One of the disciples, Thomas, was not there at the time with the others. And when they kept telling him, We have seen the Lord, Thomas replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand onto his side. Well, eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were still locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them and greeting them. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your fingers into my hands. Put your hand into my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Sorry, distracted by the flying bunny. (laughs) My Lord and my God, Thomas said. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me, but blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. I'm sure you're all familiar with that story. I know I was very familiar with it. Studying these verses in preparation for today, several things stuck out at me that didn't before. The disciples were meeting behind closed doors, right? Both times. Why? because they were fearful of the Jewish leaders. They had just witnessed their Savior, Jesus, be crucified, tortured, and killed. Right? Another thing that stuck out to me was that Jesus did not reveal himself to Thomas at the same time Thomas said he didn't believe. I thought that when Thomas said, I won't believe until I see, I thought Jesus appeared right then and there. You know why? Because that's what happened in the glory of Easter, And that's how uh, I understood the story to go. But that's not what happened. Eight days went by, right? And when Jesus revealed himself to Thomas eight days later, the disciples were still meeting behind locked doors. So they were still afraid eight days after after Jesus initially revealed himself to them. So we'll discuss those in a little bit more uh, detail. Thomas, doubting Thomas, right? He kind of has a bad reputation, right? I mean, in the context of the Bible, no one wants to be known as a doubting Thomas, do you? I don't. You know, being synonymous with faithlessness and doubt, it's not a very good thing. I'd rather be known as Peter, the rock, right? Or Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, writing the Gospels, the fishers of men. But in working on this message, it occurred to me that doubt in and of itself, is not necessarily a bad thing. Oh, all right. I have three main points. One, we can use doubt to strengthen 
our faith. But two, do not let doubt derail your dreams. And three, we can believe without seeing. Why? Because Jesus met his burden of proof. We'll talk about that more. Don't worry. All right. So how can we use doubt to strengthen our faith? Who here besides me wants to admit that there are times that you have doubted your faith? All of us? If you're not admitting to it, you're just embarrassed. Okay? At some point, we've all doubted that this guy Jesus really lived, died, and was resurrected. We have all at some point doubted that Jesus truly is the Son of God. We have all doubted God's plans for our lives when bad times have struck. And we've probably even doubted the existence of God. Right? We're not robots. God gave us free will. The ability to choose what we believe and what we don't believe. So what is doubt? The dictionary definition of doubt is a feeling of uncertainty or lack of conviction, unsureness, indecision, hesitation, suspicion, or confusion. Doubt means that you are on the fence. You're not sure if you want to believe in something or not. Doubt does not necessarily mean that you lack faith. To the contrary, I believe that it's evidence of your faith. You wouldn't doubt if you didn't care. You would not doubt if you did not at least have a seedling of faith. In other words, if God had not, al not already chosen you, marked you to be his, you would not doubt because you wouldn't even be questioning his existence or his grace or his beautiful plan for your life. The act of you doubting is proof God is at work in your life. Is the microphone distracting everyone? Because I can just put it down and project. No? It's okay? All right. When you're having moments of doubt, you are engaging in serious thoughts about your faith. You are asking yourself, what do you actually believe? Doubting leads you to ask questions. Those questions lead to answers. And the answers lead to your eventual belief and faith. Right? People doubt because they want to know the truth. And my Hello? Don't worry, we're getting to a really cool part. Better? Okay. All right. So people doubt because they want to know the truth, right? And whenever I think of the truth, I can't help but think of Jack Nicholson and a few good men. You can't handle the truth, right? I was in the Navy. I'm a lawyer. I love A Few Good Men. If I see that movie and it's on, it doesn't matter if it's the very end, the beginning, the middle. I'm all for it, right? But seriously, there is only one truth, right? Jesus told Pilate at his trial, I came to bring the truth to the world. All who love the truth are my followers. So doubt is not really a bad thing, and in some cases it can be vital. It is so important to ask yourself, is it the truth? Is what I believe the truth? Is what I am doing with my short time here on this earth the truth? Am I living my life in such a way that I am an example of God's truth? I recently joined the Rotary Club, the club in uh, Villa Park, but it's a worldwide organization. It's a philanthropic group. And Rotary employs a four-way test. And the first question in the four-way test is, 
is it the truth? Right? And uh, I've been asking myself that a lot recently. And if it's not the truth, stop. Don't waste your time. Right? It's so easy in today's society because information and news is coming at you from all these different angles and directions and it comes at you so fast. Text messages, emails, cell phones, movies, Netflix, the internet. You're exposed to so much information all the time. And it's so easy for little lies to trickle into your life, into your thinking, and eventually into your belief system. So do not let lies dictate how you live. Do not let lies tell you what to believe. And do not let lies tell you that your dream is impossible. Do not let your lies tell you that you're not good enough. Use doubt to your advantage and ask yourself, is it the truth? So if you doubt, good for you, right? You should be encouraged. Your ability to seek the truth, to seek Jesus, is proof of your faith. All right? So the second point is, while doubt can be important, you have to be careful. You don't want doubt to derail your dreams. I've told you all of this before. I spent a lot of time in school. I went to Cal State Fullerton for six full years, and I eventually um, acquired a dream of wanting to be a lawyer and maybe get into politics one day, so I stayed in school. And while I was in school, I worked at what was called the tech shop at the Crystal Cathedral. It involved the manual labor and the tedious jobs around the campus, trying to keep it looking clean and pretty. And there were some days that I became really discouraged. There were days that I began to doubt my dreams and whether God really had a plan for me. One of the jobs there uh, you may recall on Christmas Eve, those of you that worship there, there was huge Christmas trees all throughout the, the cathedral. And I mean like 50 to 60 feet tall. And each tree was covered in thousands and thousands and thousands of light bulbs. And someone, they didn't grow that way, someone had to put the light bulbs on them Yeah, that was me, right? I can't take all the credit, though, because there was another eight or ten guys that helped. But So I would go to school and then go put light bulbs on trees. And it took about three months to do that. People didn't realize it, but we had set the trees up out in the back parking lot um, I think like early October, they would show up and boxes of Christmas lights would be sitting there and you would just get started. And I'm not talking, you know, stringing them around the tree. Each branch was intricately twined. It took a lot of time. And to add insult to injury, just when you thought you were done with the trees that were going inside the church, the giant 100-foot tree would show up on a semi-truck trailer and go right there in the middle outside. And then we would have to put Christmas tree lights on that, but we would have to actually get on forklifts and uh, lifts to go up there. And there were giant bubbles of sap that would pop in your hands. Yeah. But that's what I did when I went to school. So I, I, there, were, there were moments where I was like, really, God? But eventually I graduated and got into law school. I met Annie, and that refreshed my attitude. I graduated from law school. I studied to pass the bar exam. I was ready to work and take on the world, except it was 2008 in the middle of what is now known as the Great Recession. And no one wanted to hire new lawyers that really knew nothing and pay them money to train them for the next five years. More lawyers were getting fired than getting hired. I applied for hundreds 
of jobs. The IRS, the SEC, the FBI, any district attorney office in the middle of Alaska, I would have gone anywhere. No luck, no interviews. Uh, after a while, Annie said, we have to expand our net wider, which means we had to start looking at areas of law that we otherwise would have ran the opposite way from, like family law. <laughs> family law is the nice way of saying divorce attorney. <laughs> family law has historically been looked down on by the legal community. But Annie made me apply to a family law firm in Tustin. I went to the interview with the managing partner, who will remain nameless. Her office is very impressive. It's very fancy. Fireplaces, and legal books, and comfy sofas, and travertine, and big wooden desks. And this managing partner took a liking to me and said, you have courtroom presence. And she hired me. It's like, well, cool. First interview, got hired. I later found out that she was known as being one of the meanest litigators in the history of Orange County and prides herself on being known as the Disso Queen. Disso being short for dissolution of marriage. Okay? If, you wanted, if you're getting divorced and you want to hire someone who's really going to stick it to the other side, you hire this lady, okay? After my second week on the job, one of the other junior associates at the firm quit. I should have taken that as a sign, but I didn't. I brought Annie's resume in, and she got a job there too. It didn't take us very long to realize that turnover was a constant thing at this firm. And it didn't take us long to realize that being a new lawyer is not fun at all. You didn't learn anything practical in law school. It's stressful. You work long, hard hours. I seriously spent hours every day photocopying. And in my suit, I'd be on my hands and knees digging through boxes, and there were times where I really said, did I, God, did I really spend all that time and all that money to go to law school to be a professional photocopier? <laughs> Add to that family law, you know, you're, you're dealing with people going through a divorce each and every day can get a little depressing. And there were days that I doubted God's plan for my life. And I also thought divorce, to me, I'm blessed enough, you know, my grandparents and my parents were never divorced, and divorce was a foreign concept to me, and I thought, really? A divorce lawyer? This is why I went to law school. All right. But Annie and I persevered. We bloomed where we are planted, and we learned what God wanted us to learn, and we moved onward and upward. We didn't let doubt derail our dreams. We didn't give up. We, re we got litigation experience and developed the skills that enabled me to become a partner in another firm and that enabled Annie to go out and start her own successful law practice, where she's her own boss. She's not the disso queen, though. Looking back, it could have been very easy for doubt to derail us. There were plenty of moments when we doubted whether we were good enough, whether we were smart enough, whether we were tough enough, whether we had wasted years of our lives and hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loans, but we didn't give up. We did not let our moments of doubt define us. But it can be so easy to do that, can't it? A perceived failure here or there, and doubt creeps in. You start second-guessing yourself. 
but you have to be patient and let God do his work. Remember, Thomas had to wait eight full days before God revealed himself, right? To Thomas, at least. And eight days may not sound like a lot, depending on what you're going through, but it had to have felt like forever for Thomas, based on the situation he was in. These were men and women living in fear, living behind closed, locked doors. Each and every moment for them must have felt like eternity. And Thomas must have been thinking, why did Jesus reveal himself to the others but not me? And are they going crazy and why am I not believing this? He must have felt left out and incredibly anxious. Similarly, as you follow God's plans and dreams and as you do his work, you are going to meet challenges. You will encounter perceived failures. There will come times when you seriously doubt God. The crucial question then is, how can we ensure that the inevitable feelings of doubt do not become harmful and derail your God-given dreams? Most of you know that I'm the grandson of Robert Schuller, so my answer should not come as a surprise. Doubt cannot derail you if you are a possibility thinker. If your mind defaults to possibilities instead of negativities, you will use doubt to your advantage and not allow it to hold you and your faith back. And I've heard people criticize possibility thinking and my grandfather that it was just a concept that didn't focus enough on Jesus and was just fluffy prosperity gospel. Well, guess what? Possibility thinking is all about Jesus and nothing else. When you accept Jesus and expose your brain and thinking to him through prayer, through reading the Bible, going to church, Bible studies, you draw close to him and allow him to influence your thoughts and your actions. And is there any greater prosperity than receiving the grace that comes alone from Jesus Christ? No, there's not. It's everything. And I recently reread a story about my grandfather. Uh, he had successfully planted his new church in Orange County, and he had built the Arboretum. It was a growing congregation. The Hour of Power was up and going. The only problem was that they soon outgrew the Arboretum. Too many people, not enough seats. Good problem to have. So Grandpa wanted to build a new and bigger church, and he hired a famous architect to design the Crystal Cathedral. The initial estimates in the late 1970s were that this new glass building would cost $7 million. It's a lot of money, but my grandpa thought it was doable, and so he put himself out on a limb. He accepted the challenge, and he started asking people for money and raising the cash to build the church. He asked people to give what they could give. And John Crean, a wealthy local philanthropist, gave a gift of $1 million. That's great news, right? Grandpa just kind of started, and he's already one-seventh of the way to his goal. Well, right after a receipt of that million-dollar gift, there was a construction meeting, and my grandfather was informed that the initial $7 million estimate was way too low. And it was actually going to cost double to complete the building, $14 million. And my grandfather was distraught. And think about it. He had held himself out there, exposed himself to all these people, asking them to give money and help fulfill this dream. The, he and the Christ Cathedral were in the news, and now the project was going to fail. Okay? But he was able to keep his exposure during the construction meeting, but as soon as everyone left, he locked himself in the bathroom and he wept. He had to think he was a failure. He had to doubt his dream. How do I know that? Because he went so far as to call John Crean and say, John, 
the project has failed. It's going to cost too much money. I want you to take your million dollars back. The building will not be built. And what did John Crean say to my grandfather? Bob, keep the money and use it to dig a hole. That can't cost more than a million. Just start. Trust that the rest of the money will come in. Right? And what happened? They dug the hole. And the money did come in. And eventually it ended up costing $17 million, but the building was built. How close doubt can come to derailing God's plans in our lives. Don't let it. Believe the best. Believe that Jesus, who started a good work in you, will complete it. Some of you may be saying, that's nice, Jason, but I don't believe in Jesus. Or some of you who are believers may have moments when you doubt your faith. Some of you may be saying, I don't want to hear about your grandfather and million-dollar holes. I can't even pay the minimum on my credit cards. And to you, I say, yeah, at first glance, it is not logical. The Son of God turned into human form, born of a virgin, performed a bunch of miracles, started a new faith, crucified on a cross, rose three days later, more miracles, ascends to heaven. His spirit is present today all around us. Some comic books and sci-fi movies aren't even that fanciful. You expect me to believe in all that? Yeah, I do. My final point, you can believe without seeing. Reminder, Jesus told Thomas, you believe because you have seen me, but blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. And that is where faith is required. We are required to believe in what we haven't seen. And believing in what we don't see, that Jesus lived and lives today, isn't really that hard because we have ample evidence. In law school, lawyers learn all about evidence. It's a full semester-long course. It's studied on the bar exam. There's all sorts of rules about evidence. And when you start practicing law, you quickly learn that it's all about evidence. You can forget everything else you learned. It's all about evidence. It doesn't matter what you believe to be right or wrong. It doesn't matter what you believe justice requires. It doesn't even matter what the law says. It only matters what you can prove. You prove your case by evidence. And there's two main types of evidence. Direct evidence and indirect evidence. Direct evidence is actually somewhat rare. Direct evidence is limited to an admission or an actual eyewitness of an event. A criminal confessing to a crime is direct evidence of that crime. A person witnessing a, another person rob a bank is direct evidence of that crime, right? So you have two types of direct evidence. There's only two, eyewitness to an event or a confession. But we don't always obtain confessions, and we don't always have an eyewitness to crimes. And does that prevent a prosecution from moving forward? No, of course not. Criminals are convicted all the time based on indirect evidence only. Indirect evidence is evidence that is based on an inference. If you fell asleep and wake up the next morning and there's fresh snow on the ground, you didn't see it snow, but you know that it snowed, right? Similarly, you can prove a case in court by introducing evidence of inferences. And all these inferences build like bricks upon each other until it's reasonable to assume that the underlying fact did take place. In a criminal case, the prosecution has the burden to prove that the defendant committed the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. We've all heard that. It's famous from books and TV and movies. That is what we call the burden of proof. 
It's the highest burden of proof in the law. Why? Because you are taking someone's freedom from them and putting them in prison if you convict them of a crime. So you have to prove your case beyond any reasonable doubt. <clears throat> but there's not always a confession, and there's not always an eyewitness. This means that oftentimes prosecutors have to convince jurors and meet that high burden of proof with only inference upon inference upon inference. And more often than not, they succeed. The conviction rates are very high. My son still takes a nap in the afternoons. So on the weekends, my wife and I, or I don't always watch these shows. My wife usually watches a show while my son takes a nap, and I usually read a book. She likes to watch this show called Snapped. It's a true crime show. It's usually about a woman who snaps and kills. <laughs> it's true. The woman usually snaps and kills her boyfriend or husband. And I admit, sometimes I enjoy watching. I'll, I'll be reading and I'll, and I'll hear peripherally this story evolving and I kind of get hooked. You get to, you as the audience get to play the detective. There's no confession and there's no eyewitnesses. That wouldn't be any fun. There's no direct evidence. These are a, a whodunit, like a mystery novel. Was it the wife? Was it the girlfriend? Was it the wife's crazy new boyfriend? And as the show progresses, you learn more and more about the case. Oh, the husband was unfaithful. Yeah, that's probably important. Oh, the wife learns about the infidelity. Investigators obtain a search warrant and seize the home computer. And on the home computer, they realize that someone Googled, how do you poison someone? <laughs> Several days later, Credit card receipts prove that the wife purchased duct tape, rope, and rat poison from Home Depot. <laughs> and, don't laugh, Terry. Not surprisingly, days later, the police find the poor husband, scumbag, dead from rat poison with his hands tied behind his back with duct tape. Okay? There's no confession. The wife denies it. There are no eyewitnesses to this murder. Yet, despite the lack of direct evidence, we know the wife is guilty because of the indirect evidence, right? She had a motive. She had internet searches, her Home Depot purchases, etc. The burden of proof will be met and the wife will go to jail. So, turning back to our faith in Jesus, it is my position that he easily meets his burden of proof. In this case, there is indirect evidence and direct evidence. It's a no-brainer. As a disclaimer, lawyers love their disclaimers, okay? This is not an attempt to lay out all the evidence that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again. It's not a message on apologetics. If you are interested in those facts, and there's a lot of them, I encourage you to read Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ. It is detailed, it will strengthen your faith, and will help you to be able to explain your faith to non-believers. Today, I merely want you to know why you should believe without seeing. This isn't a court of law. There are no rules of evidence applicable here. We only have our logic and life experiences to guide us. And I propose that there is a mountain of evidence in support of Jesus Christ. There's so much evidence that it's easy for him to meet his burden of proof, and you should believe him without seeing it. In Jesus' case, there is actual direct evidence evidence. Jesus himself confesses. He admits he is the Son of God. He admits he was crucified. He admits he rose from the dead. 
He admits that his spirit is alive and well and present here today. And even in a courtroom, these admissions, Jesus' confession, would be particularly powerful and persuasive evidence. Why? Because these confessions, statements, and admissions were what we call in the legal profession an admission against interest. Throughout his time on earth, Jesus admitted and spoke these words, even though it placed him in great peril. And indeed, he was tortured and killed for them. He was given numerous abilities to recant his testimony, but he did not. He's so cute. (laughs) Sorry. How many times have you read the story of the trial before Pontius Pilate and said to yourself, oh, Jesus, just deny it. Please deny it. Pilate's trying to give you ways out. Take them. Take them. Don't put yourself through the pain of what's to come, right? Admissions against interests are considered incredibly trustworthy because the thought is, why would someone lie and expose himself to pain or death? They wouldn't unless they were speaking the truth. Well, in a court of law, the confession and admissions of Jesus would likely be enough. He would win his case. But there's even more evidence. There is additional direct evidence. There are eyewitnesses, right? We have Matthew. We have Mark. We have Luke. We have John. We have Paul. We have Peter. There's a lot of them. These are all people who dropped everything, their livelihoods, and followed Jesus. They followed Jesus even after he was crucified. Remember, both times Jesus appeared to the disciples in the story, the doors were locked because they were hiding. They were hiding because they were terrified. They were terrified they too would be tortured and killed. But this did not stop these eyewitnesses from spreading the gospel. They too made statements against their interests, and indeed many of them were persecuted. These eyewitnesses provide further powerful and persuasive evidence. Is that enough? Pretend you're the jury for a second. You have heard Jesus himself confess. You have heard from multiple eyewitnesses. Do you require More proof than that? Probably not. But lawyers don't take anything for granted. We got to get all of our evidence in. So there's a ton of indirect evidence as well. There are millions of followers of Jesus Christ around the world. People who have not seen Jesus with their own eyes, but have experienced his love and grace just the same. These people testify about Jesus on a daily basis. My father, Jim Coleman, is one of them. His life, if you've heard his testimony, you probably have, his life changed in a moment. He encountered the Spirit and his life was never the same. Those of you who have ever talked with him know that he shares his testimony at all times. Jesus is living and changing lives of his followers every day to this day. This church is evidence. If you think about it, the odds were against this church, and it really shouldn't exist, but here we are, right? Most of you know my mother, but not all of you saw and experienced how she suffered emotionally and physically with everything that happened at the cathedral. But here she is, here we are, worshiping our Lord and our Savior. So I'm about to close, I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And as they do, I'm going to ask everyone else to close their eyes. Take a couple deep breaths. Everyone in this room, is evidence of Jesus Christ. Something brought you here today. Something tugged on your heart that made you get up early on Sunday. 
even though it was raining, even though it was cold. Something made you get dressed. Something made you get in your car and drive here. Something made you sit here, here, and sing along with this music. Something made you hear and read these Bible verses. Something made you listen to this sermon. You being here, right here, right now, is evidence that Jesus is at work in your life. That something you feel is him. Don't ignore him. Say yes to him. Believe without seeing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us free will, the ability to choose what and who we believe in. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. He lived amongst us. He walked with us. He died for us. And he rose again. Jesus, please give us the faith to use doubt to our advantage without it derailing us. Thank you that we can believe without seeing. Amen. The battery's dead. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for that defense of our living Lord. Hallelujah. So stand for the benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his smile to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May he give you peace that passes all understanding. Peace in the midst of the storm. Peace in the midst of the storm. May he give that to you. May he also give you faith that is unshakable. Though the earth quakes, faith that's unshakable. Though people assail your faith, faith that is unshakable. Even though you can see no reason to believe, faith that is unshakable. May he give you hope that is unsinkable. And may he give you love that is unquenchable. In the name of Jesus, be blessed. Amen. And for our last song, go ahead and turn in your songbooks to page 48. We're going to go ahead and sing again, Lament for the Nations. Again, that's going to be page 48. Well, we haven't sang Lament for the Nations yet. (laughs) Thank you, Jason. That was a beautiful message giving us the courage to believe even though we cannot see, giving us that evidence. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And with that evidence, you have the victory in your life. No matter what you face, no matter how hard it is, we want you to go out victorious knowing that Christ can do miracles in your life. Amen? He's giving you the victory right now. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. To the Lord of Lords! Let's ring it out together, sing. Us. You 
have shaken the land and torn it open, mend its fractures, for it's quicken. You have shown us desperate times. We've been staggered by your words. Rejected us and burst forth upon us. Father, you have been angry, Lord, but now restore us. Oh, you have shaken, shaken the land and torn it open, mend its fractures. Hope Center. We'll see you next week.